So, um, a friend of mine um, uh, sort of demanded in the next presentation I do that I involve uh, Game of Thrones in my in my topic of conversation. Um, and after I, uh, cursing my past self for accepting uh, his challenge in a slightly inebriated state. I thought that maybe there might be a bit of mileage in what he was suggesting. Um, the Game of Thrones is filled with societies that are completely and utterly entwined in their landscapes, um, and in return they affect their landscapes. Um, the Greyjoys, for example, um, whose slogan is, we do not sow, um, are so entangled in their landscape that they refuse to in, in the maritime landscape that they refuse to accept any sort of outside influence. I think in some regard we can see this in the Mesolithic of the Baltic area um, during the Neolithic Mesolithic transition. Um, the problem we have with uh, this area and this time is that um, you have hunter-gatherer societies persisting in a landscape that is continually modified by Neolithic farmers. Um, and as such, in the literature, um, these hunter-gatherers are called Neolithic hunter-gatherers. Um, that, that sounds quite strange to me. Neolithic, to me, conjures up the idea of agriculture and husbandry, of taming the land um, and, and altering the earth. Um, so in this presentation, I'll try not to use so much the terms Mesolithic and Neolithic, but try to use more uh, cultural indicators. Um, so the uh, <laughs> Neolithic colonization of, of the Baltic started at around 4000 BC, um, and it took quite a long time to, to consume this geographical area. But right up until the Bronze Age, we have a persistent hunter-gatherer culture. Um, um, so in this presentation, we'll be talking about the Baltic area, but in particular, southern Sweden, Denmark, Estonia, and southern Finland. We'll be talking about how this pitted where hunter-gatherer culture interacted with the maritime environment, and how this was significantly different uh, from corded ware and funnel beaker farmers. So... Um, the, the corded ware uh, farming culture started at around 2,900 and ended in about 2,300 BC. They were their their uh, subsistence strategy, strategy was almost wholly farming, um, and their grave goods um, included these really beautiful uh, pots and also battle axes, leading some scholars to call them the battle axe culture, which I think is an absolutely amazing name. Um, <laughs> The, the funnel beaker culture, um, again, are farmers. Uh, they're roughly contemporary uh, to the corded ware culture at the, at the end of their time span. Um, and they are monument builders. They, they interred their dead in these, these large megalithic monuments. Pitted ware hunter-gatherers, on the other hand, uh, span from about 3,200 to 2,300 BC. Um, they were a hunter-gatherer fisher economy, um, and they persisted in a time, like I said earlier, that was uh, under direct Neolithic influence. So the aims of this presentation are really to uh, examine the spatial relationship of these uh, different cultures and different sites to the sea, um, to understand the economics and dietary information that uh, revolve around these cultures and to hopefully bring these two aims together to examine how uh, the maritime zone affected the life and death cycles of hunter-gatherer groups and farming groups. <coughs> so, spatial relationships to the sea. Um, as we can see in Estonia, the pitted ware uh, groups often um, inhabited the maritime zone. Um, the, the pitted group ware groups are, are in black. Um, the corded ware groups, on the other hand, are often slightly inset from the, from the sea. Um, 
and it's it's not much but it seems to be a, a deliberate rejection of living directly on the coast uh, we see this again in Denmark and southern Sweden um, with the, the red dots uh, being the, the pitted where hunter-gatherers and almost entirely living in the coastal zone whereas these uh, corded ware and funnel beaker farmers um, are very much inland. Um, if we look at the economy and dietary information of these different groups, perhaps from what we've just said there's nothing too surprising. Um, the hunter-gatherers, these pitted ware hunter-gatherers, these uh, circles, surprise surprise, living in a, a, a maritime environment ate mostly <coughs> marine foods. Um, the, uh, the, the farming communities ate mostly terrestrial foods. Um, we, we see at uh, various cemetery sites um, across uh, Sweden that the majority of, of uh, foodstuffs that are consumed are, are seal and marine foods for these pitted ware hunter-gatherers. And again, um, at Korsnas in Finland, these pitted ware groups um, ate a, a, a solely marine diet. What is interesting, though, is that when you compare this, this uh, isotope data to, um, to the, the pottery and the lipid residue on the pottery, we get a more interesting textured understanding of, of really what's going on. Um, the, the pottery of the pitted ware culture, the, the decoration is very, very similar to that of the Urtabola. The Urtabola is this hunter-gatherer culture that existed in a time when there was very limited Neolithic influence. Um, and it's, it's almost a uh, sort of a harkening back to a time when, um, when there was less modification, less uh, modification of the landscape. Um, in most cases, when you um, examine pitted ware hunter-gatherer sites, you see a deliberate destruction of this kind of pottery. Um, in the case of this Vaspier uh, grave site, um, it seems that they are deliberately beheading the, the pots and, in, and inverting them into the ground. Um, when you look at the lipid residues of these pots, this, this type of pot, the majority of the content relates to terrestrial and vegetable material. Um, quite, you know, quite contrary to the, the marine resources that we've seen them eat in the isotope record. Um, so there's, there's, you know, there's something really strange going on here. Um, it appears, from, from my point of view, that they are deliberately killing these terrestrial uh, food stuff pots um, and interring them in the ground almost as a deliberate rejection of, of um, this idea of terrestrial living and a Neolithic economy whilst at the same time hearkening back to the past with the decorations very similar <coughs> to the Urtabola culture. Um, and this leads us very nicely on to um, this idea of living and dying by the coast in, in this time. So the majority of cemetery sites in the pitted ware culture um, often contain a lot of uh, domestic activity as well. Um, we see that there are in most cases hearths associated with, um, with burial grounds and, and various dwelling structures and uh, pits and, and other domestic activity. Um, and again, at Asvide, um, we have these large black cultural deposits intermingled with the cemetery sites. Um, these black deposits are shown to have a large amount of uh, uh, seal residue um, associated with them. As we suggested earlier, uh, that was a, a almost a staple diet for, for these people. Um, so this idea of directly relating 
death and burial and, and life and the consumption of foods to the maritime environment is really quite prevalent uh, to the pitted ware culture. We see a similar pattern at uh, Kosnas uh, in Finland um, where we have um, burials associated with uh, living structures. When we compare this to the funnel beaker farmers though, we get a slightly different image. We have the domestic sites inland as I, as I uh, showed earlier, but the uh, mortuary structures, these large megalithic monuments, are almost entirely situated on the coast. Um, now this could suggest some sort of involvement with uh, the, the ancestors uh, of the past uh, living in a maritime environment, but it could also be, um, we, we, we have to remember that Neolithic groups, um, the whole culture surrounds taming the land and, and, and uh, domesticating the land, and this idea of building mortuary structures by the coast could be uh, the, about the need to tame the maritime environment as well. When we examine the uh, grave goods of the different groups, we see that in many cases, pitted where um, cemeteries have uh, these absolutely lovely um, seal bone and seal teeth um, ornaments associated with them, um, whereas corded ware groups are often buried with uh, terrestrial domestic uh, animal bones such as this uh, cow scapula. Um, so it, it, you know, it shows a really quite significant dichotomy between how um, pitted ware groups associated every part of their life with the sea and these corded ware groups tried to associate themselves with the land. Um, so what can we conclude about about these two groups in the maritime environment. It seems like the, the, the Neolithic corded ware and funnel beaker groups, they, they domesticate their animals, they, <coughs> they, um, they, they alter the earth, and they, they try and tame it. And yet, they, they cannot seem to, to, to tame the maritime environment, so they, they actively reject it and pull themselves from it. Whereas these pitted ware groups are completely and utterly entangled <coughs> in the environment in which they live. They not only live off the land through, through their various uh, subsistence strategies, but they, they embrace the maritime environment and bring it into their, their ritualized way of living, so that both living and death is entangled in <coughs> within the sea. At the same time, it seems like they are rejecting a, uh, a, a terrestrial way of existence and perhaps rejecting a Neolithic ideal. They refuse to, to um, alter the earth um, through this idea of uh, beheading and destroying uh, pottery um, and at the same time try to harken back to a possibly to them a, a purer way of existence through the Urtabolo culture. Thank you very much.